Welcome back to The Breakfast. Uh, moving on to other discussions this morning, still very much related to challenges with insecurity. Um, a few days ago, there were, actually sometime last week, there were reports of the president um, answering uh, an invitation uh, to the National Assembly to, of course, um, answer questions with regards the government's efforts on security. Um, a couple of days later, the presidency then, of course, uh, announced that the, uh, President Muhammad Awari was not going to be attending that invitation or, uh, you know, speaking with the National Assembly members. Also, uh, in this discussion we're about to have, Abdul Rashid Mena, after many, many years of evading um, a questioning by the Nigerian government, has finally showed up in court with the same script played by a lot of Nigerian politicians when they are being questioned by authorities. He fainted. We've invited this morning uh, uh, Libros Oshoma to quickly join us and, of course, uh, share his thoughts on this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. All right. I I'll start off by saying there seemed to be a lot of misreaction among uh, members of the legal pro profession. Um, even the attorney general has come out to say that um, the president's uh, attendance uh, response to the summon is basically discretionary. There are those who say he has to. What side of the divide are you on? Uh, I'm on the side of uh, the attorney general. Um, let's not um, you know, stand the law on its head. The president's attendance is discretionary. Uh, we can't be compelled to attend. But the president haven't accepted to attend. That means he has um, you know, opted to, to waive you know, the fact that he can't be compelled. So he has accepted to attend. Uh, moreover, it is not of, it's not a legal issue. It is more of a moral burden. The fact that the president swore to uphold the letters and the tenets of the constitution, to which protect lives and properties, because the essence of government is the security and welfare of the people. And people dying in droves. The president didn't even need to wait for anybody to invite him or summon him. He can't be summoned by the National Assembly. He didn't wait to be invited. He ought to have voluntarily, like you know, other presidents have done in America, you know, testified before the National Assembly on the step taken so far, and then you know, have like an interactive session with them on, on what can be done. It's not a legal issue, it's a moral issue. And so if you look at it from that point of view, then we shouldn't be too legalistic about it because if we are legalistic about it, we will miss the point. We we'll lost the ball. And then, rather than talk about the fact that people are dying and that the government is unable to protect lives and properties, we will, you know, be unnecessarily fixated on whether the National Assembly has power to uh, uh, summon right. the president or not. That's not the issue. All right, um, Mr. Shoma, I, I want to bring back a question that I have always been bothered, you know, about. And that is about the, now that we're talking about this, is more very likely because the numbers were very shocking. 43 uh, Nigerians murdered in such a gruesome manner. And I was asking last week if this in any way seems to be playing to the gallery because the lives of seven Nigerians mean the same as the lives of 43 Nigerians. Life of one Nigerian should mean the same. And so the fact that the National Assembly is inviting the president at a time like this, is it in any way playing to the gallery, or is it simply because of the figures that we are looking at? I, I do not think it is playing to the gallery. I also do not think it's because of the figure. Mind you, in the history of this country, the president that has, escaped, that has, uh, uh, that has uh, enjoyed you know, the most goodwill is this president. Since this president came on board, in spite of all the promises that they made, Nigerians have consistently created excuses for his ineptitude and inability to meet up with the promises that they made. And so now that it is obvious, 
very visible to the blind and audible to the deaf, like they say, that look, this government can no longer protect lives and properties. So some party members in the government and other opposition members feel the need to call on the president, at least, like we say in law, or the other repartee, here is side of the story. So it's not about playing to the gallery, because if you're talking about 42 people, Undume, Ali Undume, senator from Seboronu, also stated that about 72 Islamic clerics were slaughtered on a day by Boko Haram. And then also to tell you the, uh, also about the fact that this president and this government enjoy so much goodwill. All right. From Boko Haram, we no longer call them Boko Haram now. We now call them armed bandits, terrorists. We call them terrorists and bandits. We call killers. On rampage, we say, oh, Fulani, uh, or we say, headers, farmers clash. A man who is in his farm and suddenly attacked by, by killers. How is that a clash? So that will tell you the goodwill that this government has enjoyed. So I do not think that anybody that is calling on the president to act now or to speak up is playing to the gallery. All right. Let me, let me ask you quickly, before we go to the minors um, um, issue, the, the, the um, spokesperson for the House of Representatives, as Benjamin Kalu, has uh, come out to say that the president seemed to have listened to the party leadership against his initial desire to come and speak to the people. Some are saying it's moving the bulk, that he listened to the advice of some APC uh, lawmakers and the party itself, and he asserts that the party's will is stronger than that of the president. I want to give hear your perspective on this. Is this argument a fair place to stay when it comes to the non-appearance of the president on issues that bothers the security of the people, which is his primary responsibility? I, I think um, all of these um, uh, deflating the issue, like I have said before, whether who, whose advice the president is listening to here is immaterial. The question is, um, the president is incapable of engaging in a conversation with the National Assembly. And so, I haven't accepted to appear before the National Assembly. They probably, you know, thought he would go there and read a press script. But against the backdrop of the fact that some members, maybe likely from PDP, might likely want to put questions to the president. And, and so, they quickly beat a retreat. And then the attorney general had to come timely. It came in handy to say, look, the president cannot be summoned constitutionally. That's what travails the constitution, or that's what travails the powers of the National Assembly. And so the president cannot be summoned. It was a way of looking for an excuse. I had a bet with somebody that the president will not appear. Because if you look at the antecedents so far, the president is incapable of engaging in a conversation with the National Assembly. And so, if you put the president in right before the National Assembly to have a discussion on security matter, that will further expose the incapacity of the president, and then people might now be calling for his impeachment. So, the, the Attorney General had to come handy. And then now, the, for me, what the uh, spokesperson of the uh, uh, House of Rep is simply doing is to look for excuses. Oh, the president's listening to his party member. Let's assume, without conceding that he listened to his party member, didn't the president listen to his kitchen cabinet party member and others before he accepted to appear before the National right. Assembly? He probably would have done that. But okay. having reviewed all the issues, and then they decided that they wouldn't want to expose you know, the president to further ridicule, and so decided to beat a retreat. And then what, something that is very jamming quickly is the fact that this also brings to fore the call for the, a divorce between the office of the Attorney General and the Minister for Justice. The Minister for Justice is the chief legal officer, is the legal advisor to the government, while the Attorney General is the chief law officer of the entire country. And so you find out that consistently every Attorney General in Nigeria has always find it difficult to separate these two offices. And so that's why they consistently act as though their allegiance is to the government alone without bothering about the people. All right, let's uh, move on uh, and quickly speak about Abdul Rashid Mena. 
um, of course, whose name is popular across the country. A um, couple of days ago, of course, he once again, like I said, uh, played with the normal script of the accused Nigerian politician getting to court and collapsing. Um, I want to quickly get your thoughts on, you know, those, you know, recent happenings and, you know, where we seem to be going. With all be this. Before you take on the question, let me quickly chip in that it is alleged that he faked and he faked the collapse. Is it possible that the man actually collapsed because he felt faint or is it the... Um, suspicion that has grown and the behavior of past politicians that is making everybody skeptical what that is, he indeed was um, what is feeling faint. With that court, Liberal Social, is there something in the court that oh, makes people faint? Is there. Uh, I know? will. Uh, um, before, before I go there, please permit me also to quickly touch on um, the young abducted students in um, Casina because I have children in boarding house. And I feel the pain, the fact that children who are in school can be abducted from school. And then the president is in Daura on a working visit. Because according to a report, he will attend the executive council meeting on Wednesday via Zoom. So he's on a working visit. And yet, the president is so busy working in Daura that he cannot take a stroll to Katsina to assess and visit the place where this abduction happened. And you are still talking about capacity of Mr. President. He lacks the capacity. All that right. said, In, okay. I can also tell you, uh, Mena, unfortunately, what we have here, mm -hmm. until we start to, to prosecute lawyers alongside their... <laughs> Their, their clients in matters, in criminal matters, we will not see the end to fainting. What These are it? scripts. There is nothing in court that make people faint. These are scripts acted in collaboration, acted by defenders in collaboration with their lawyers. Because it is one script too many. Most times, when ha what happens is once you are in the dock, the, your counsel will apply that you'll be allowed to sit. And in most cases, the judge will oblige. And so you sit down. A man who, can, who has been seated comfortably in his home, it's now in the dock, seated. And then the next thing, he's fainting. When he's asked to, to uh, account for his misdeed. Before that would happen, there would have been a rehearsal between him and his lawyer in the office. And what God could, should do, let them put a police dog. This is seriously, I'm not joking. Put a police dog within the court premises. The moment, anytime they faint, let them release that police dog. They will wake up. And so, if you remember, in the case of Ibori, Ibori in London was being prosecuted. The, his lawyer also was investigated because before you are prosecuted, the um, security agencies would have crossed their T's and dot their I's. So when confronted with the evidence, you have no other option but to own up. Your lawyer will tell you to own up because he knows that if he attempts to deceive the cops because of the funds that the state will spend prosecuting that matter because of his lawyer's antics, the Bar Association also will investigate such lawyers and if found culpable, might even go to jail before his defense uh, is a uh, client, like in the case of Ibori. But here... If the lawyer can do anything, employ all sorts, and go scot free. Okay, that, that's it. That's a, if, a, a, a fresh perspective. So that is why you are seeing all of those uh, uh, drama that you see play out in court. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Libora Soshoma, for joining us on the breakfast this morning. Uh, your time is appreciated. My, my pleasure. Right. That, that's Fresh a new perspective, perspective yes. for me. Um, uh, of, prosecuting the lawyers as well as their clients. Uh, you know, sometimes um, I, there is always this sand of doubt in my mind when they say that these people stage this, um, uh, you know, um, feigning that they are sick, you know, and this would now, this, this growing perception that this is all staged. The day a genuine case would happen, 
we will not be able to differentiate the two. I mean, you barely get to hear about, you know, petty thieves or, <laughs> oh, or falling. You know, small, you know, <laughs> people who stole bread. You barely get to hear that they fainted in court. You barely get to hear of people who fought with their landlords fainting in court. You know, it's always the it ones is. who stole billions that in somehow Nigeria. inhale the court's you know, air and, it's and they makes get them sick. dizzy. It, it's, I mean, know. it's only Nigeria that we hear these kinds of yes, things. Yes, I, I don't know. Uh, but, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I'm sorry, let's see what happens in the coming days. Um, he will still be appearing in court. He's not going anywhere. He's at the correctional center after absconding. If you're still bright uh, and you faint in court, they will flog yeah. you. Um, to <laughs> We'll go on a break. When we come back, we'll be talking with Boogie November on what's trending on social media. Stay with us. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.